the world is starting to get the feeling that rate hikes, maybe they don't matter after all. There was supposed to be this enormous sledgehammer striking the economy in order to halt inflation in its tracks. Instead, here we are in 2024, and in the US anyway, everyone is still afraid of more inflation. And many people say the economy's absolutely booming. How can that be in the wake of the most aggressive rate hiking campaign in all of human history? Well, today, we're gonna go over why there is so much emphasis on these interest rate policies to begin with, and then, what is really happening in the global economy? Now, in a big picture macroeconomic sense, rate hikes or cuts really don't matter. Now, they do for certain segments, for parts of the financial markets like bonds and things like that, as well as different, different parts of the U.S. economy or the global economy or any economy, housing and other interest rate sensitive sectors. But the public is starting to get the sense rate hikes really aren't all they're cracked up to be. And I started to go into this in my last video on the Fed's massive historical money problems, including why this has led to Jay Powell more recently flip-flopping back and forth on his inflation views. But it was really Alan Greenspan in 1991 who spilled the beans. We talk about interest rate targets, we talk about the Fed funds targets, because that's all the Federal Reserve actually does. Interest rate targeting is what the Fed has become, and so it has been made into the most important aspect in all of human society. Now, for the most part, we get interest rates backwards anyway. Throughout history, we see rising rates are associated with reflationary and inflationary periods, fundamentals, growth, and inflation expectations, along with some other things that Newt Wicksell was talking about more than a century ago. And conversely, interest rates going down aren't stimulus, they're a bad sign. That things are not going well in the real economy, that demand for safety and liquidity has gone way up. That's not a good sign. So we get interest rates by and large backwards from the very beginning because we need to emphasize the Fed's ability to do this, to target an interest rate because they don't do anything else. Now, what most Fed officials and economists will tell you is that it's a little bit more complicated than that. And what the Federal Reserve or any central bank is really trying to do is to either raise rates or cut rates either above or below the natural or neutral interest rate. The neutral interest rate denotes where monetary policies are neither accommodative nor restrictive. So if you're trying to slow down the economy in order to slow down inflation, the theory goes that you need to raise interest rates, short-term interest rates that are your benchmarks as a central bank, above the neutral rate. But among other problems, economists and policymakers have no idea what the neutral rate actually might be. Jay Powell, at a speech in Jackson Hole last August, basically admitted that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to figure out if they get their short-term benchmark above the neutral rate. He said, real interest rates are now positive and well above mainstream estimates of the neutral policy rate. We see the current stance of policy as restrictive, putting downward pressure on economic activity, hiring and inflation, but we cannot identify with, the, with certainty the neutral rate of interest. And thus, there is always uncertainty about the precise level of monetary policy restraint. And that's assuming all of this is the correct interpretation of how the economy works to begin with. Because there is no one single rate that would be restrictive. It might be restrictive to some people, but not restrictive to other people. So we're making an assumption, or they're making an assumption, that an average natural rate or an average short-term rate that's above the natural rate is somehow restrictive. You kind of get the feeling they're just making all this sound like it's important and that there's, there's something more substantial behind it than what's really there. What's actually really there is just communication. The Federal Reserve is using the federal funds target, just like the ECB uses, uses its rate corridor, to signal to economic participants and financial participants what it wants to signal to you. Back in 2014, the Federal Reserve was thinking about undergoing a transformation in its rate targeting and rate policies because by that, by that time, the federal funds market itself was basically a shell of what it used to be. Federal funds was nothing. It really wasn't much going on there. That was true to an extent in the pre-crisis period too. The Eurodollar system had far surpassed 
federal funds for the primary money market means and unsecured money markets. So in 2014, they said, well, why should we keep the federal funds target? Because the federal funds market is really mostly irrelevant. And the answer they all kept coming back to was communication. In July 20, 2014, I'll give you a quote from uh, Eric Rosengren, who was the president of the Federal Reserve Branch in Boston. He said, first, I view the use of the federal funds rate as a communication tool rather than a hard target. I mean, just coming out and say, saying it. This is consistent with the second main bullet in the reorganized revised principles memo that says, the committee intends to adjust the stance of monetary policy primarily through the actions that influence the level of the federal funds rate and other short-term rates. I like that phrasing, influence, is not the same as target. Specifically, we are communicating using a federal funds range, but it is important to move short-term rates more generally. I'm less concerned about a thinly traded market dominated by the GSEs. So we use the federal funds target to signal to markets and the economy what we want to signal to the markets and the economy. If we want to tell you that we're being accommodative, we're going to lower the federal funds target. Now it's a range. If we want to signal that we're being restrictive, we're going to raise the federal funds target or the range. And then we're supposed to believe that somehow this higher rate, whether it's above the neutral rate or not, this somehow this higher rate acts as a restraint on the real economy, despite the fact that all historical evidence shows that higher rates are associated with looser money, better economic potential rather than restriction. What they're leaving, what they're leading us to believe is essentially that somehow, some way, this impacts the banking system. That by raising the the short-term money rate, that makes credit creation more expensive. But Paul Volcker went through this exercise in the 1970s and early 1980s, and it didn't really work out that way either. So what they're basically telling you is that don't worry about the details. We're going to signal to you. You're going to think that raising rates somehow makes banking more expensive. Therefore, banks are going to do less credit creation. Therefore, the economy is going to be restrained. And if you actually believe all that, then you'll start acting as if that's true. And then you'll actually become the restraint that the Federal Reserve wants. That's what's supposed to happen. And that's why the federal funds rate is at the top of the communications toolkit. That's what the Federal Reserve does, as Alan Greenspan admitted in 1991. They've made this rate hiking, rate cutting policy the center of everything. This is not the first time that we've seen interest rate policies basically have no impact on the economy or the marketplace. It's just that March 2020, the pandemic, everything seems to have erased our economic memories, including what happened in 2008. If you remember, the flip side of what we're going through today, Ben Bernanke's Federal Reserve undertook the most aggressive rate cutting program in human history during the first part of the global not financial crisis. And we ended up having the global not financial crisis anyway. As Ben Bernanke st said in January 2009, as the wreckage was still being wrecked throughout the global system, he said, as indications of economic weakness proliferated, the committee continued to respond, bringing down its, its target for the federal funds rate by a cumulative 325 basis points by the spring of 2008. In historical comparison, this policy response stands out as exceptionally rap rapid and proactive. In taking these actions, we aimed both to cushion the direct effects of the financial turbulence on the economy and to reduce the virulence of the so-called adverse feedback loop in which economic weakness and financial stress become mutually reinforcing. But that happened anyway. But here's what Bernanke said about it. These policy actions help to support employment and incomes during the first year of the crisis. Unfortunately, the intensification of the financial turbulence last fall led to further deterioration in the economic outlook. Not the economic outlook, economic reality. And that, that further turbulence in September and October 2008 was in spite of this dramatic rate cut action the Federal Reserve had unleashed, along with all the other measures the Fed had appealed to at the same time. 
you get the feeling that none of this actually works. Not Certainly not in the way that it's promised and talked about in the mainstream. Not just the rate hikes or rate cuts, but pretty much everything. You go back further, the, the rate hiking cycle in 2004, 5, and 6. During Alan Greenspan's swan song in the first years, the first months of Ben Bernanke's tenure, the Federal Reserve hiked interest rates a quarter point every single meeting for 17 consecutive meetings. And the results were hard to find. Now, many people to this day still believe that those rate hikes caused the, the housing bubble to collapse, but look at mortgage rates. Look at some of the financial indicators. Some of the financial indications like issuance of asset-backed commercial paper absolutely exploded higher during the rate hiking regime. Rate hikes don't matter as much as you think. They do again matter in certain places, but as far as the macro economy as a whole, it's all just a puppet show. And it was Milton Friedman who basically identified this way back in 1963. In one of the footnotes on page 250, Friedman said this about the Federal Reserve, and it sounds exactly like Ben Bernanke's, what he was talking about in 2009, and it sounds exactly like what Jay Powell is going to say over the couple months ahead. What Friedman wrote was, it is natural human tendency to take credit for good outcomes and seek to avoid the blame for bad. One amusing dividend from reading through the annual reports of the Federal Reserve Board, sriot him, is the sharpness of the cyclical pattern and the potency attributed to the system. In years of prosperity, monetary policy is said to be a potent instrument, the skillful handling of which deserves credit for the favorable course of events. However, in years of adversity, monetary policy is said to have little leeway, but is largely the consequence of other forces. And it was only the skillful handling of the exceedingly limited powers available that prevented conditions from being even worse. That's exactly what Ben Bernanke just said, and that's exactly the tone you get from the Federal Reserve today. Our policies are limited because of other factors. We're having problems slowing down and halting inflation because it's out of our control. We can only do what we can only do, which is true of everything. The Fed changes interest rate targets, and so we're supposed to believe that is everything. When all the evidence continues to show, there is so much more out there that actually matters. So what is actually happening in the real economy? Not just the United States. We need to think globally here because there is a globally consistent picture that includes the U.S. And the answer is really simple. We're on the downswing of the supply shock. The thing is the downswing of the supply shock takes its own time. It happens on its own schedule. And we can't predict it because so many aspects of this are unique and unpredictable. But time and again throughout the data, not just in the U.S., I'm going to use some European data here. We're going to go side by side and make comparisons to show you. It's the supply shock that's in charge here, not the Federal Reserve or ECB. It's not about rate hikes. So that's what we see in everything from retail sales to GDP to bank lending to consumer prices. Starting out with retail sales in Europe, Real retail sales started falling in late 2021. Prices became too much. Nominal sales started to slow down. These are long before rate hikes were even a thing. They hadn't even, central banks hadn't even begun them, let alone thinking about an aggressive series of them. And keep in mind as we go through all of this, even the most hardcore proponents of interest rate targeting will tell you that it takes a while before they actually come to full effect. So these inflections that we continue to see across the global economic data they're not time to rate hikes. The full impact of rate hikes would be much later in the, in the calendar, in the cycle. These are all timed instead to mainly the last part of the supply shock's upswing, which was the oil price surge in March and April 2022. And then the second one in May that really, that really unleashed the downswing here. It wasn't rate hikes, it was the oil shock. U.S. retail sales. Those change all the way back in 2021 too. You can see clearly real retail sales started to actually flatten out and then contract. And real retail sales in the U.S. began to fall more consistently after April of 2022. Again, not rate hikes. Even nominal retail sales made a big shift, a big shift. They didn't start falling, but they slowed way down when? April of 2022, not rate hikes. GDP, 
Maybe the best example of what I'm talking about here, the synchronization between the US and Europe. And you don't think that's the case because Europe has been mired in an unofficial recession for all this time while the US is booming. Well, if you line up real GDP and the trends over the last couple of years, there's more similarities than you, than you probably are aware of. Real GDP in, the, in Europe, that started to slow way down and hit the, hit the, um, the recession over there. And real GDP in the United States actually slowed way down in the technical recession, remember that? Long before rate hikes. So US GDP and European GDP, they both slowed down, not exactly at the same time, but it was before rate hikes got started. And neither economy has been able to accelerate back enough to get back on the prior trend. Even the US is still falling behind the post pandemic trend let alone something like the 2008 trend. So US and European economies slow down to varying degrees. That's the difference that we keep coming back to. Bank lending, European bank loans started to contract and sideways as a contraction all the way back in September of 2022. It wasn't rate hikes, that was the collateral crisis, the guilt stuff that went on way back then. US bank loans, U.S. bank loans started to slow down in June of 2022, just a little bit. And then the bigger inflection in February of 2023, not because of rate hikes, but because of what became the regional bank crisis of March and April last year. How about consumer prices themselves? Consumer prices in Europe, those peaked again, October 2022. We keep coming back to this. And the core rate, the core HICP rate starts to slow down after April of 2023. In the United States, the US CPI, you can see clearly a change in direction after June of 2022 with oil prices. Now the core CPI is more modest and that begins to slow down after September, 2022, and really after April of 2023. And there's a debate about the core rate, but you can see even in the US core CPI, the inflection begins in the middle of 2022. And you really see this when you take out shelter prices, the CPI all items less shelter, totally disinflationary from June of 2022. Rate hikes are not the reason for all of this. 2022, yes, that's when rate hikes began, but it's when the supply shock turned from upside to downside. Why does it seem that Rate hikes aren't making much of a difference because they're not. We are pre-programmed to believe the Fed is all powerful. The ECB is all powerful. And what the Fed mainly does is interest rate policies. So we're supposed to believe that interest rate policies are this massive thing, even though when you think about it just for a couple seconds, it doesn't actually make all that much sense, especially in the historical context, as I said. What's really happening in the global economy is that th this is the downside of the supply shock. And the downside of the supply shock is in control of everything. And as it's in control of everything, that means it happens on its own schedule, its own timetable, doesn't care a bit about Jay Powell or Christine Lagarde. And there are several factors a part of this downside of the supply shock cycle that we're not really accustomed to. Labor hoarding, nominal versus real, all of that kind of stuff. The unpredictability, all of it goes hand in hand. The economy is still experiencing the same cycle, which has been worse in certain places than others, but that doesn't mean we aren't all following along. That means more disinflation, more downturn, more recessions. And like the rest of us, the Federal Reserve is along for the ride too. It's the story you've never heard. Why does the Fed target interest rates to begin with? Why don't they do money? That's the video I've got linked below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members, all our Eurodollar University subscribers. And until next time, take care.